This picture that you see here is uh, David, is it David Mattingly? No, Ben Mattingly. I don't know why I'm saying David. Seventh animal for all that. Mattingly was the, the guy that designed all these basically, apart from like the first two or three and the Chronicles, I believe. But he put them together and on Etsy.com, you can go and purchase big prints. It's quality paper. I did that and I put it in a frame. Thank you, Mr. Mattingly. That is the artwork from my favorite book of the whole series. And funnily enough, today, we're gonna look at it in depth. That is number 13, The Change. Remember, go, if, if you have a favorite book, it's probably on Etsy.com in one of these fancy dancy big prints. And I'm hoping to get some more in the future. But for now, let's concentrate on the book itself. This is The Change, it's the second Tobias book, and boy howdy, is it a good one. Let's get into it, shall we? Now we're coming off of The Andlight Chronicles, which was always a fan favorite, but it was a complete letdown. This book is also a fan favorite, but I knew going into this one, because I've read it over and over again over the years, I knew that I, I'd still love this book. I loved it from probably the first time I read it up till now. And there's always a way that I know if I like a book or not, and that is how long it takes me to read it. If a book takes me three or four days to read, then I'm probably not enjoying it as much. If it, if it takes less than a day, as this one did, I know that I've enjoyed it because I haven't put the book down. This one took a, a few hours for me to get through. I interspersed it with painting a bedroom that I need to repaint. This is awesome. It is absolutely awesome, and I'm gushing over it, and we haven't even gotten into the plot yet, but let's just get, let's go into it, okay? First positive point, straight from the off, we don't start with any of the bullshit. We don't start off with dealing Dan's or the circus or fucking chasing rednecks with shotguns. We just get straight into the story. There is a bit at the start where we find out that um, Rachel has won the Hewlett Packard international student thing it's just, it's just some award let's just call it an award so she's won that but that's relevant to later in the story so it's not like it's completely irrelevant and then tobias finds rachel and says right we're gonna um we're gonna go explore some york pool entrances before that at the very start of the book we find out that tobias has sunken to his birdie instincts Last time we saw him was back in book three, which was very shortly after, very shortly after he became a hawk and he's struggling to basically accept life as a hawk. As soon as we start this book, he sees a mouse, goes, grabs it, eats it, dumb. He is, he's now a bird, essentially. He is now a bird. And this is an underlying message throughout this book. You'll find out as I go along, there are a lot of underlying messages in this book. I'm not even gonna be able to cover them all. I'm just gonna cover the basic ones, but the first message that we're getting is, Tobias has accepted who he is. This is what he does now, and why should he fight it anymore? Just, just make a lemonade out of lemons or something like that, I don't know. Tobias takes Rachel out to find Yerkball entrances, which is yeah, fair enough, you know. When you've got a bit of spare time, it's not exactly a dangerous mission. You're just flying and looking around unless you get shot, obviously, as we find out can happen in book two. But they, they go do that. There is one thing, actually. We've always been told that they have to keep their distance from each other when they're flying. They've got to be like a kilometre apart so bird spotters can't spot them. And they're over the mall, so a busy area. And Tobias says... Well, this is an action. I shot by just beneath Rachel's big eagle wings and swung out past her, then turned and moved in front of her. So the whole, oh, let's keep apart thing is gone, is it? Well, no, because a few pages later, he's like, oh, we've got to keep our distance. So this whole part where you're fucking doing acrobatics around her, like a fucking, like you're fucking flirting with her or something. That, you just forgot at that point, did you? Whatever. I mean, I suppose it is Rachel there, so every time Rachel is in an area, the rules are just fucking thrown out the window. We have a nice little discussion between Rachel and Tobias. He brings up the Packard Foundation Outstanding Student Award. And she's, 
She feels bad, obviously, because he can't go along. He's a bird now. You can't exactly have a red-tailed hawk in the, in the bloody award ceremony. But Tobias is just like, well, oh, this is what I am now. Don't feel bad for me. It's, we're going back to the start where he just fucking goes and gets the mouse. You know, job done. This is who he is. Why are we, why are we fussing about it anymore? But there's a funny little line on book, uh, on page 15. And I think it's quite apropos, really, for Animals, the series. Where Tobias is saying, What was I thinking? Rachel's a human, a real human. I'm a hawk. You think Romeo and Juliet were doomed just from being from families that didn't like each other? Well, you can't get any more doomed than caring for someone who isn't even the same species. What have we seen in Animorphs <laughs> from the start to the end? I mean, we've just seen Elfanger and Lauren. That turned out to be rather doomed, didn't it? We get to see Aldry and Dak later on. Spoilers. And uh, was, was that doomed? Because they did... I mean, they loved each other till the very end, we assume. No, oh, it's just one of those things, you know. I think that line is, uh, I think that line's been deliberately put there. You can't get any more doomed than caring for someone who isn't the same species. I think that's, uh, that's a sneaky little line put in there, and I rather enjoyed that, so uh, well done. And then, a few pages in, we get into the main thrust of the action of this book. Two hawk bajir come out of a hole in the ground. And they, they run off, and they're chased by a bunch of human controllers with motorbikes, which is awesome. And Tobias and Rachel obviously see the hawk bajir and at first they're like, oh, the yurks are up to something. And they see them running and being chased. They're like, oh, hold on a minute, this isn't right. So they go after these two hawk bajir. And um, Rachel says, the enemy of the enemy is my friend. So they're like, if they're running from the yurks, then maybe they know something or they're, they're running from something. We need to guide them somewhere and find out what the hell's going on, essentially. So they go down, they talk to the hawk bajir. Um, the hawk bajir, there's a whole thing about privacy here and secrecy and not letting slip the fact that you're humans. There is a chance that these hawk bajir would be like, those voices are distinctly human. But we've seen from how the Andalites speak that they talk like fucking Californians. So pff, the hawk bajir probably hear that and think, oh, that sounds like an Andalite to me. But well, whatever, that's, you know, that's not a downer on this book. So... They guide the hawk bajir away from oncoming motorbikes and, and people with guns. And it's quite a thrilling little scene. Tobias is guiding these hawk bajir around. One of them, turns out to be Ket Halpak, gets hit by a truck and ends up going in another direction. The male, Jarahami, turns around, stops and is just like, My bitch, my bitch is gone. And Tobias is like, well, what the fuck are you doing? Just move. Why is, why is he... It's like to Rachel, what the hell is he talking about? Because they don't know about these hawk bajir. They, they just don't know. They have no fucking idea. So this is the first time they've ever heard from a free hawk bajir, even though they don't technically know this hawk bajir is free yet. But they make this hawk bajir, Jarahami, run the other direction. Unky Dory. Right. So they find a cave, the hawk bajir dives in, Rachel and Tobias obviously head back to inform the others. They then have a big meeting. Just one thing before we move on with the plot, there's, there's a niggling little bit in here that I was rather not fond of. Tobias says back to Jarahami, can you swim? If so, chop down a sapling. Jarahami obviously chops down a sapling, jumps into the lake with barely a splash, so it's quite an acrobatic dive, and obviously he's able to swim away. Go back to book four, page 124. They've just rescued Axe, they're swimming away from the imploding dome ship, and Axe says, Hawk Bajir, do not swim. Yes, that's right, Axe says, Hawk Bajir, do not swim. So we have contradicting things here. Now, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Hawk Bajir as to whether Hawk Bajir swim? Or are you going to believe the dunder-headed, often stupid, Axmilly Escaruth Ist Hill? Obviously, go back to Andalite Chronicles, and Elfangor didn't even know that Hawk Bajir climbed trees or eat with their mouths. At least that's implied that he doesn't know those things. So obviously the Andalite education system is fucking bullshit, isn't it now? 
Either that or it's a K-A-S-U, Catherine Applegate screw up. It's one of the two. Either the Andalay education system is shit or Catherine contradicted herself. Or maybe it was Michael doing one of his, you know, typical 180s. Who knows at this point? The Anwars have a great little scene in Cassie's barn. And I say it's great because it's so well written. Every line is just perfectly placed. Everybody's acting in such good character. Peak character moments here. It's awesome. There's some funny lines thrown in. There's good banter. And it's a very serious discussion as well. It is a serious discussion. They're, they're sitting here thinking, right, so this could potentially be a trap. Obviously, it's Marco who brings up that point because... He's the one with that sort of mind of, now hold on, what are we missing here? And I, li I like that. Cassie is acting like Cassie, saying, you know, these could potentially be the only two Hawk Bajir, you know, we, we need to take this seriously, what are we going to do? Jake is being his... <laughs> J I, I love Jake in this scene, because everybody else is going off on these tangents when he's talking, and Jake's just constantly like, look, can we please just fucking focus on what we're talking about? And, and I like that. It's the only good bit Jake has in this whole book, mind you. Because apart from this, he's a bit, he's a bit shit. Not in terms of character, but in terms of him as a leader. But they decide, Axe says, uh, what does the Hawk Vajir want? Which is surprising coming from Axe. It's probably the only part of this that didn't seem quite in character. Because let's face it, the Andalites don't really care about the Hawk Vajir. Why would Axe care about what the Hawk Vajir wants? But I don't know, m maybe... Maybe he does feel a little bit of, you know, maybe we need to take into consideration what this lesser species wants. Lesser race, as if I would say it. They decide to go find out what the male Hawk Bajir wants. And apparently they have a plan. Now this Hawk Bajir is in a little cave, a very dark little cave, barely any headroom and quite far back. About six metres de deep. And they have the brilliant idea, the fantastic idea. Shut up, phone. They have the brilliant idea of trying to walk into this cave with a Hawkbajir who they don't know anything about. What an idea, lads. Top quality shit. Fuck off. Oh, fucking things just bleeping at me in the background. I'm, I'm working here. So the, the brilliant idea that they have is to crawl into this cave head first and just hope that Mr. Hawk Bajir is going to be nice and sweet. Thankfully for them he is, because if he wasn't they'd be fucking dead. Dead! Just, just dead! I don't know why I'm putting the book away because I was going to come up to a quote. So that they, they bring the Hawk Bajir out and there's a bit of tension between Axe and the Hawk Bajir. They're sort of like looking at each other like fucking... And um, obviously we don't know why... <laughs> Fuck's sake. <clears throat> Hello, Pebble. Hi. I'm in the middle of recording a video. <laughs> All right, talk to you in a bit. <laughs> Love you. Give me a kiss. <laughs> Goodbye. I'll call you back. Goodbye. Women. There are hints in the Andalite Chronicles and past books which says that the Andalites failed to save the Hawk Bajir, but there's no real detail. Oh no, the quantum virus. We learned about the quantum virus in the Andalite Chronicles. <coughs> and I am wondering if this one came before or after the Andalite Chronicles, because the Andalite Chronicles is a little bit of a spoiler for this one, because we've heard of the quantum virus now. We've heard of Aloran's decisions which would explain why the Hawk Bajir are a bit peeved about the Andalites. But anyway, there is this tension between them. And there's this funny little line from Axe, because uh, he says, Yes, we failed, but I'm here now, and I don't kill Hawk Bajir unless they are tools of the Yerks. What do we know about Hawk Bajir at this point, Axe? They are all tools of the Yerks, every single one of them. So, <laughs> you're just going to kill them all? Great, great, great job downplaying the, the tension of the situation there, Axe, you divvy. Even Jarahami is just fucking like, <laughs> you're talking bullshit. <laughs> Jarahami does this awesome bit 
where he cuts his own head open to prove that he has no yerk in his head. I mean, people would say, well, that's a very extreme thing to do. He obviously knew that he could survive it and it would heal very quickly. And let's be honest, how else is he going to prove it? They couldn't prove that Jake wasn't yerked without having to chain him down for three days. How's... Jarahami has known Yerks all his life. He probably knows that unless he actually shows his brain to these Animorphs, there's no way they're going to know that I'm not a Yerk. So he cuts his own head open, shows them. They're all just sort of like, OK, that's a bit extreme, isn't it? And then, uh, but that's it. They know now that he is free of his Yerk. So they now have, they know it's not, a, it could still be a trap technically, but they're, it's more likely now that this hawk has genuinely escaped from the Yurt Pool and they're like, okay, we now have a free hawk What do we do? Rachel and Cassie spot taxons coming their way and they know that there'll be hawk following, so they have to move out, essentially. And they know that they've got very limited time left. And so uh, they decide that they're going to use a, dis a disguised... Animorph as Jarahami. So Jarahami will go back into his cave and Rachel comes down and says, I shall morph the Hawk Bajir and I shall be the distraction. Bearing in mind that Cassie has said, we've got about five minutes left. Five minutes takes a couple of minutes to morph. You're very limited on time. This is where Jake becomes a bit of a disaster apart from, you know, no, he was already a disaster when he decided to send Axe into the cave rather than bring the Hawkbajir out first of all. But whatever. You've got very limited time. Axe is in his own body. He should acquire the Hawkbajir and morph. You cut the time used up in half, at least. But no, Rachel swoops down and says, I'm going to fucking do it. I don't give a shit. What does Jake say? Fuck all. Zip. Nada. Nothing. Right, Jake, come on, mate. You should have known, but this... <laughs> Jake, 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 you're on limited time. You don't put up with bullshit. Rachel has done this countless times now where she just completely... She takes things into her own hands. She just rushes down and says, I'm doing it, I've got dibs. No, Jake needs to step in and say, Rachel, stop it. Get back up there, Axe, you take that morph. You will cut our time in half. You will give us twice the amount of time to get out of this situation. Rachel, you don't need to do this. You don't need to be the big hero. Get back up there. Do your job. <laughs> but no, he just sort of stands back and watches as Rachel just takes control and does whatever the fuck she wants. Jake, you're failing here. And once again, Cassie objects to people morphing of ascension races without their, without their permission. As a, remember one book ago where she just morph raped Rachel. <laughs> and now she's all like, oh, we need to get permission first. Fuck you, Cassie. <laughs> Bitch. So Rachel morphs Hawk Bajir. She morphs Jarahami. We've established his name at this point. They've had their little introduction. Marco is all disgusted that, <laughs> that Rachel would morph Hawk Bajir. We'll get more into the attitude towards the Hawkbajir later on. And we have this little greeting ritual bit where the Jarahami and Rachel are sort of sizing each other up and giving a bit of a slash and bash. And um, then they kiss because we know that the headblade thing is a kiss. This is a weird little greeting ritual. And as far as I know, we never see it again. We see Hawkbajir meeting again in the future, I believe. But they we, they never have this little dominance ritual. Now the thing about dominance rituals, it's usually, you know, it, it follows violence. It, it, it's usually, dominance rituals, if there's a dispute between animals and there's a dominance thing, then there's often violence to sort out the conflict. We know that Hawkbajir are non-violent, so this greeting ritual was a bit, it didn't, to the zoologist in me, it didn't feel right, but hey-ho. <laughs> Why would the hawk need to establish dominance? Maybe that's how they choose their mates, but that's never really... I don't know. I don't know. I just think it was thrown in there for the fun of it. <laughs> then this weird thing happens. They, they go off to do their jobs, and suddenly Tobias is in a different place. He was riding on Rachel's horns, and then suddenly he's flying up in the air somewhere else. 
And this has happened before where he's been transported. He doesn't know what's going on. And he's like, what the bloody hell is this? And then he sees Ket Halpak, which is the female hawk bajir down there with human controllers surrounding her. And there's one demorphing. And what do you know, Jon Snow? It's Visser 3. Because Visser 3 is always there. Thank you, Poverina, for that joke. So Visser 3 does his moustache twirling act. And on page 63, I don't even need to look it up. Tobias says, Andalites are impossible to sneak up on. Now remember in the Andalite Chronicles, we, we fought this as well, but Chapman stuck up on Aloran. <laughs> One book later, and Aloran, though technically Visser 3, is snuck up on. Two in two books. Are we just going to scrap this bit of lore at this point? This whole idea that Andalites are impossible to sneak up on. So T Tobias says they're impossible to sneak up on and then proceeds to sneak up on him successfully. <laughs> I think at this point we scrap the idea that Andalites have 360 vision. You remember that scene in the TV series where Axe gets the ropes thrown over him? Canon now. That's genuine. That can happen. Apparently. So Tobias rescues Ket Halpak and they run off and, and she's reunited with Jara Hami. And it t they, t they love each other. J Jara Hami expressed this earlier. He was like doing the whole rip heart ripping out thing. And, you know, we'll get into the message in, in a bit. But they're reunited. They go back into their cave and Tobias agrees to look out for them for a bit. And they're talking in their cave. They mention the word Coatnodge, which turns out to be Sprog, essentially, a uh, child. And later on, as Tobias and Axe are looking after the Hawk Bajir, Tobias sees in his head that there are taxons coming. And he doesn't know how he knows. He just knows. And so he takes Jara and Ket and starts to move off. Jara explains that there was a voice in his head that told him where to run when he was in the Yurtpaw and how to escape. And Tobias finally says, right, something's going on here. Cool's bullshit. And then what do you know? Jon Snow, it's the Elemist. Two books in a row, we get the Elemist. Now, we've established by this point that he is a bullshit artist, essentially. He says, oh, I never interfere. But he clearly does. And Tobias, straight away, is just like, mate, just why are you doing... Just come straight out, would you? Just fucking admit it. You're fiddling with me here. Sounded wrong. I mean, he says he doesn't interfere, but he's actively moving Tobias from one place to another. L just like, uh, no, go, go over there. Uh, actually, there. <laughs> it is like he's, he's playing some sort of game of chess, and he's looking at the chessboard, and he looks at Cryk and just says, oh, look, uh, uh, Beyonce. And then quickly as... Cryak's looking the other way and being a fangirl, even though Beyonce sucks. He's like, right, uh, Rook uh, is there. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> he, he does interfere. He's cheating the game. He, oh, my God. This brings me back to something that I actually forgot to mention in the Andalite -like Chronicles. He says Alfangor broke the timeline. Uh, the timeline was broken, so we had to fix it. And I've, I've, I forgot to mention the video. Well, if it's broken, it, it, it can't be broken because your timeline in the future clearly involves Tobias. And if Alfanga hadn't broken the timeline in the first place, Tobias wouldn't exist. So it wasn't broken, was it? You're just fucking around here. <laughs> this guy is such an interfit. He's a bullshit artist. He's like the fucking Democratic Party of America. Oh, we didn't rig the election. <laughs> Pfft, who knows? <laughs> Don't mean to get political on you for a second there. Sorry. <laughs> the Elemist says that he's offering a deal to Tobias. Because Tobias doesn't think it's enough to obviously save the Hawk He knows he's doing a job for the Elemist without having been asked to do this job. So in a way, yeah, rightly, Tobias is like... What what's in this for me? What you're just using me at this point? You know, give me something in return. And he doesn't actually say what he wants in return, which turned out to be a bit of a mistake. And he probably realised that shortly afterwards because the elmist just says, "I shall give you what you want." And Tobias is like, "Okay, uh, I think I want this." 
I don't explain what it is. <laughs> but he goes back to the Hawk Bajir, having settled this in his mind that he's going to get a deal out of this and he's going to get to be human again. At least that's what he thinks he's going to get. We then get a rather touching moment where Tobias is starting to bond with his Hawk Bajir. Because he's, he's basically stuck with them the whole night. He's not <laughs> got much choice really, has he? And they stop to eat and he finds out that they eat tree bark. So they start chopping down the tree bark and, you know, they try to share it with Tobias, which is a common theme in this book. They're always offering bark to people. I and mean, they're, they're really wholesome. The, these two hawk bajir, as the book goes on, you realise these are really just wholesome characters. Tobias finds out that each blade on a hawk bajir has its own purpose. And this is more than just what it seems on the surface. I think this is one of those underlying messages of this book. Everyone has their different purpose. Tobias, throughout parts of this book, is upset that he can't join the fight, that he, you know, he has to go off and just f fly around and search for things. And he doesn't appreciate that role. He thinks that he's basically wasted among the group. But as Ket Halpak explains, each blade has a different purpose. It's for a different part of the tree. And obviously Tobias doesn't straight up say, uh, this is an analogy to my way of thinking, because obviously it's not going to be that fucking, you know, in your face. It's more subtle than that. But that is Ket Halpak saying everybody has a different part to play. And we get more of this analogy later on. Not this specific analogy, but more of this message later on. But that was a good little way to put the analogy across without it just being in your face. It's quite a subtle one, but a good one. He finds out that the Hulk Bajira are essentially pacifists and they're just caught up in the middle of this war because of their blades, which was originally meant to cut down tree bark. And Tobias is like, oh shit, <laughs> that's all these times we've been told that Hulk Bajira are these peaceful innocent creatures we've just sort of been like i don't fucking know but now yeah gen dit it's actually that's how it is and he feels bad he doesn't even want to tell them how he eats he probably feels bad that he has to go eat other living creatures i don't know why he'd feel particularly bad about that but maybe it's a self-conscious thing like these creatures are just so pacifistic that I feel bad telling them that I'm just going to go kill something just to feed myself. It's it's a strange little scene, but um, yeah, a very important one for animals as a whole, really. Before this, the Hawk Bajir were just like stormtroopers, essentially. You know, nameless, faceless. They were just, you know, the enemy, really. And there'd be a, the occasional line of, oh, I've I've heard that these things were peaceful back in the day. But now we actually have names and faces to these creatures. Not just us, but the animals as well. In fact, even more so for them, because Tobias has just had to spend the whole bloody night talking to these creatures and finding out that they really are just decent, simple, kind-hearted creatures. And he's just like, I've, I'm fighting these things, you know, and this is the sort of stuff that completely crushes the black and white paradigm of animals. It's gone by this point. This is probably the final crushing blow to end the black and white paradigm. Because your enemy, the, these are not your human controllers that occasionally an animal will just slap into unconsciousness. The animals kill Hawk Bajir. Not that often, only really when they have to, but they do. And they've probably killed a few by this point. And now they know who they're killing. It's not just something they can just shrug off as, oh, I don't know these things. Now they know. Now they know that whenever they're killing one of these Hawkbajir controllers, they're killing a host who is, as far as they know, a fucking pacifist, essentially. A kind-hearted, lovable pacifist. And it's, it's shit. <laughs> it's, and it's got to be shit for them as well. I mean, remember these kids are 13, 14 years old and... They're now realising, huh, I'm basically killing Gandhi. <laughs> Not quite Gandhi, because uh, I don't think he was a pacifist really, was he? I don't know much about Gandhi, so I'll probably take that back. If you want more of this stuff on how I see the Hawk Bajir human relation going on, go watch my Plight of the Hawk Bajir video, which was done a few months ago, I think. Go watch that, because I go more into detail about the human Hawk Bajir relations, essentially.
Anyway, let's crack on. The Animorphs all join together, and up to this point, they've not identified themselves as humans to these Hortbajir, because they know that if these Hortbajir were, you know, still under your control somehow, or whether they would be recaptured, they, they can't know that they're human, because they'll just reveal who they are. They've sort of gotten past the point of thinking that this is a Yurk trap. They're pretty certain at this point that these are genuine Hortbajir fleeing for their uh, freedom. And they ask the Hortbajir, you know, if you get captured, and the Hortbajir are just immediately like, no, fuck it, no, free or dead shit. <laughs> free or dead! And Rachel falls in love with them at this point because that's sort of her attitude, really. And so they reveal themselves as humans, and the Hortbajir are all surprised and shocked, but they're... They're sort of like, oh, that's, that's cool. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, well, well done. <laughs> and uh, that was a fun little moment as well. But they, they go off now. They go up to find a valley, which the Elmist has shown Tobias, and they start to take them up there. I will have to ask, why did they have to show the Hortbajir that they were human? Couldn't they have just made them turn around and close their eyes again? Because they've already done that with Jara Hammy. Just These Hortbajir will just do as you say. <laughs> They're not going to argue with you, are they? They're just going to turn around and, you know do all that and they could just I don't know demorph and then morph something else but they decide to walk up hill as humans for whatever reason I suppose because it's a long trek but you're probably going to cover more distance in your animal morphs take some time to demorph and remorph and carry on it's you know I don't know why they have to be in human form for this. But the Yurks throughout this whole book are chasing down these Hortbajir and now they're pulling out the big guns. They've got this, this army of Taxons, Hortbajir, humans. They've got helicopters now starting forest fires and it's all gone mental. But they're heading up this hill and Tobias is briefly distracted trying to get some food I think. And no, no, he, ch he finds the helicopter and he gets swept up in the, the rotary winds and crashes into a bush, breaks a bone, and a raccoon comes to get him. This is the second time he's been sort of knocked down and attacked. It was a bobcat earlier, but he managed to get away. And the Elemist sort of just pops in. Do you want your deal now? And just Tobias is like, fucking yes, please. And nothing happens. And Tobias is like, uh, pff, uh, aren't I supposed to be human now? And the Elemist says, oh, you got what you fucking wanted. So fucking be grateful and shut up. Tobias says, oh, I don't fucking want this. Refund. I'll give it back. But no. Tobias is stuck with his new thing now, which is the morphing power once again. So he morphs this raccoon. And he's able to morph again. Great. The Elmus just snaps his fingers and magically does the thing. Tobias waddles along with a raccoon for a little bit, demorphs because the raccoon's fucking useless in this scenario, and heads back to find the others who have already realised that they're in some form of trap. And then Tobias has a plan. Now this is interesting because there was a question on the Animals Discord a while back of who would take over if Jake was no longer the leader? Tobias does all right here. In fact, he probably does better than Jake in coming up with a plan here. I mean, it's not great, but <laughs> it's better than what Jake normally comes up with. So he comes up with a plan. Jake's just like, okay, we'll leave this to you. This is your plan, fair enough. There is an odd part, though, where Tobias decides that he's going to morph Ket Halpak and he and Rachel in the Hawkbeer bodies are going to pretend to jump off a ravine and fake their deaths, essentially. Which is... it's probably the best plan. I mean, if you think on the surface of it, what else could they really do to convince the Yerks to, to leave? So they have to play dead. But there's... Uh, why would why Tobias? I mean, we find out. Jake takes Tobias's role. Is that a good decision? On the one part, it means that the leader's got overview of everything, so that's a positive. But we find out very quickly that Jake isn't very good at guiding people. And when you're in a life and death situation, surely you want the most well-trained in that job doing that job. Tobias just decides, right, I'm, I'm basically new to this morphing ability at this point, and yet I'm going to morph this new creature and do the thing. No, not, no, 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 no. Despite the pros of Jake being able to see everything, you need Tobias in the sky because that's the, that's the job he's good at. That's what he does. That's what he's done all this time. Why would you change that now, last minute, when you're in a life or death situation? 
Jake, you should be stepping in at this point again, but you fail to. Nevertheless, they go ahead. Jake fumbles around with directions, but eventually gets them going in the right in the right place. And the idea is for them to jump into a ravine that they know is there. They also somehow know that there's a like a gap in the ravine wall that a gorilla and two hawk bajir can safely stand in. The gorilla can reach out and pull a hawk bajir in. Apparently, they know that. Apparently, also they also know exactly which part of the ravine to jump off of. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. They have a bit of a fight. Uh, Rachel and Tobias have to go through some hawk bajir to get to where they are. And at this point, I think it's J Jake says you're about 15 seconds from the ravine when they're in this scrap. And he's currently in Birdmorph. We know that because at the end of this little battle, he comes down and swipes at the eyes of one of the hawk bajir to allow Tobias to get up and charge for the ravine. He goes to the ravine. There's Visser 3. Rachel has already jumped over the ravine. <laughs> Tobias looks at Visser 3, says 3 are dead, runs at him. Visser 3 dodges because he doesn't want to get taken down into the ravine as well. And Tobias falls, grabbed by Marco because he magically appeared and he knew exactly where to stand. And Visser 3 just happened to stand in front of the ledge just above where Marco was. <laughs> and the worst part of this bit is that Jake has had time in about 10 seconds to go to the bottom of the ravine, demorph, morph wolf, and get in position. Mind blown. <laughs> there, the way it's written, it feels like there's about a 10 second gap. Jake saves Tobias. Tobias gets up, runs forward, sees Visser 3, shouts free are dead, charges, jumps off the ravine. A few seconds later, Visser 3 looks over. That must be, at most, 20, 30 seconds. And Jake has demorphed and morphed Wolf and also travelled to the bottom of the ravine in the first place in order to do that. What the fuck? This is the biggest letdown of the book, the ending. It, the, the, there were so many little conveniences there again, and I hate those little conveniences. Marco just happened to be in the right place as they jumped off. Jake managed to get down there within about, within about 20 seconds, morphing at fucking Superman speed. It's just a bit silly. Visser 3 standing at exactly the right place on the ledge. Yeah, not great. But that's basically the end of the book. The Visser, in his usual way, is just like, I'll oh, just leave him to the walls. No bother even just, like, getting rid of the evidence. We're in the middle of nowhere. It's a fitting end for these two escapee hawk -bajir. He gives a warning to all the others and then off he trots. Obviously, <laughs> Jara and Ket are at the bottom of this ravine and they're actually getting eaten by these wolves. I mean, that must be a fucking shitty role to have. <laughs> and they must have had some hell... The scars after that must have been pretty horrific because they're actually getting chunks ripped off of them at this point. At least that's implied, but whatever. They go to this hawk -bajir Garden of Eden and the, the animals leave them there. They find out that Kwatnodj means baby hawk -bajir. And so they're like, oh, they're going to have a little baby hawk -bajir. And this is really the last we see of Jar and Ket for about 10 books because obviously they're out of the action. They're trying to manufacture a child, which obviously isn't going to happen in one or two books. We won't be seeing them for a little while. Now... Tobias has his morphing power back. Great, he's part of the team again. But then the weird thing happens. He, the, the Elemis somehow moves him back in time to meet himself. And I thought there was a whole thing about meeting yourself. I thought it created like a paradox or something, but apparently that rule is discarded here. Tobias finds himself and tells to young Tobias, go through the construction site knowing well, very well that he will bring himself back to that situation he's in. He's accepting his role. Get it? He's accepting his role. And he acquires his own self. And then the next day, during the award ceremony for Rachel, there he is, Tobias, at the end. And he finishes by saying, hello, Rachel. And that's the end of the book. What is the underlying message of this one? There are a few. Obviously, the first one is, 
accept who you are, accept the part you play because you do have a part to play. That was the whole blade analogy of the Hawkbajir arm. Every the Hawkbajir body, every blade in the Hawkbajir is built for a different purpose. We also get that with Jake taking Tobias's role. I don't think it wasn't done. I think it was done on purpose, not so much for. The, the, the logic behind those decisions, but more to put the message across. Tobias is seeing his role from Jake's perspective, essentially. And he's learning that Jake is essential because even though he stumbled and fumbled a bit, it was vital that Jake was there telling Tobias where to go. So all throughout this book, Tobias is like, oh, I feel useless because I can't morph and whatever. But, you know, the different blades are different roles. He sees from Jake's perspective and sees how important the role of Surveyor is. And it is, this book is about accepting who you are and finding out that you have a role to play. No matter what it is you're doing, everybody has their role to play. And that's a good message. That's not the only message from this book. Usually these books, if they have a message at all, it's usually a single message. Maybe with little extra bits thrown in, but usually one solid message. This has at least two solid messages. And the other one is a pretty classic one. One that has been told throughout time forever. And that is Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover. That's where the hawk bajir come in. Because we see the attitude of the animals to look towards the hawk bajir especially Marco, because at every turn he's like, you're friends with these things? Oh, that's gross. Why would you be friends with those? And, and um, that's built on perception. Put it this way, they've gone to save an Andalite before, Aximili. They've now gone to save uh, two Hawkbajir. And the attitude of the animals in those two scenarios has been completely different. Why has it been completely different? Because they have a perception bias. They see the Andalites as these heroes and saviours, and they see these Hawkbajir as the enemy. But they're not the enemy. But even when the animals find that out, they talk of these hawk bajir like, oh, mm, not so sure about these guys. And uh, they tend to put the hawk bajir down, even when they're standing in front of the hawk bajir. The hawk bajir is sort of there in the background, mind their own business, and they'll be saying, oh, we've got these two space goblins with us. And it's just like, it's a bit rude, isn't it? <laughs> but they don't care. Yeah, it's, it's the attitude of the animals towards what are considered a lesser species or lesser race. And I don't like thinking of the hawk as a lesser race. I don't think any right-thinking person will automatically say that's a lesser race. That's never a good way to go about things, seeing people as lesser or greater or anything like that. That's not the right way to go about things. It's, it's very clear that the attitude of the animals is different to the hawk because they do judge the book by the cover. And for, for all we call the animals heroes, they are flawed. They aren't perfect. They, they really aren't. And that's a positive, actually. That is a positive that they have this flaw that they will look upon these hawk as almost lesser. And that it's almost, you know, they'll, um, they'll rescue them out of, I don't know, tolerance or just because they feel that they have to, like it's a chore to them. Whereas they actively went out and sought Axe when he was the Andalite under the sea. They get a bit friendlier to the hawk by the end, but as the series progresses, the hawk are almost a burden to the animals at times. It, and it does come across like that, even though the hawk accommodate them in more ways than, than one. And it's a very interesting thing that we'll look at as we go forward, how the animals look at different races and how they interact with them. Because for all their kindness and sweetness, the, the kindness and sweetness that the hawk offer to the animals, they hardly ever get it back, um, except for the possible exceptions of Tobias and Cassie. Especially Tobias at this stage is obviously the first to warm towards the hawk because he befriended them quite quickly, having to spend time with them. The hawk are not the enemy. I was thinking when, when I was uh, thinking about this book, about World War I with the trenches. The Germans and the English were, and the Allies, sorry, were, were enemies. They were the enemies. They shot each other all day. But funnily enough, Christmas came along. And what did they do Christmas Day? They called a ceasefire. And they came up out of their trenches. 
and they played a game of football. They played a game together and they cheered with each other and, and they had fun together. They weren't enemies on that day. They weren't. They were enemies in name and after Christmas Day went by, they went back to shooting each other. And it got me thinking about this. The Hawkbeardier aren't that different from humans. They really aren't. And I think that's one of the, another message that we're trying to get across in this book is, even though somebody may look a lot different than you, they might be very much like you in more ways than you can imagine. And we get that with, with these characters. And the English and the Germans and the Allies in World War I recognise that too. We're fighting against each other, but we're still people. We, we're st we, st we can still find mutual enjoyment with each other and we can find mutual respect. Yes, these Hawkbeardier are taken over by the Yerks all the time, but the animals are quick to find out that these Hawkbeardier aren't that different from us. They really aren't. And so we'll see how this relationship be that between the animals and the Hawkbeardier carries on throughout the series. But again, that's not for a little while now. <laughs> jarahami has got to do the thing <laughs> if you get my drift. This book is awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. The ending was the only letdown, and we've, I've gone over that. The little coincidences that come along with the ending of that book were a letdown. Is it enough to drop it down a point? No. No, no, no. Because if I could, I'd give this book 11 out of 10. It is just... Firstly, the writing. We've, we've had it in the past where there were bits in the end like Chronicles and the start of The Stranger where it was just poorly written, as in, like, literature. Poorly written. This book was very well written from start to finish. I couldn't find any problems with flow or anything like that. The characters are all as they should be. They're all perfectly in character. Brilliant. Visa 3, though he does appear, his appearance is limited, very limited. And if I started marking down Visa 3 for appearing, no book would ever get 10 out of 10 again. <laughs> we introduced Jara and Ket, who are my favorite characters barring perhaps Toby Hammy. They're just so fucking wholesome and charming. And there are so many worthy messages in this book that are very subtly done, very nicely done. And just everything about this book, apart from that final scene at the ravine, the scene at the ravine, if it weren't for that bit, I'd say this book was better than The Predator. Because I think, on the whole, I think Predator's still a just a little bit better I still think Predator's a bit better. I'm biased towards this book because obviously it brings about my favourite characters. But this book, if it weren't for that ravine scene, would be just flawless animals. Flawless. It's just that bit that lets it down. I mean, even, even the lines, they were funny lines in this book and there was really good banter between the characters. Everything just came together so fluidly in this book, and it's no surprise that book 13 is, is regarded as one of the greatest books of the Animal series. No doubt why, this is, and this is why it's on my wall, a fantastic piece of work. Jake's leadership, shocking. <laughs> so I've gone through all that pra play, praise. What did Jake do in this book? He didn't do very much. He didn't take charge when he should have, and when it came down to come up with a plan, he just gave that job to Tobias. Because he didn't do that much, I can't score him too harshly, but when he did do stuff, he did stuff poorly. I'm going to give him a 3 out of 10, so pretty poor going, Jake. It's been a while since he's had a good book. As for the book itself, I can't give any, I can't give any less than 10 out of 10. It's a straightforward 10 out of 10, no questions asked. If you disagree, feel free, but go see a psychiatrist. Stunning book, absolutely stunning. And the next one is going to be, well, it's going to be a bit of an unknown quantity, isn't it? Because it's the unknown. And that will be sometime around Christmas. I might record, if I don't get it up, it's because it's the Christmas period. By the way, I did mention Christmas earlier and it is Christmassy doodles. It's Christmassy doodles. Ah, so that's the unknown next, another Cassie book. And remember to go read my fan fiction. This is the interrogation number 55. I'm currently writing number 64. It's slow going, but it is coming along. And remember to join the Animals Discord. We have a blast over there. We've, we've, we've almost reached 400 members now. So uh, come along and join the fun. Thank you very much for watching this awesome, awesome book. 
uh, me talking about it in probably a much less awesome, awesome fashion. Thank you very much. And if I don't see you by then, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Ta-ra!